the Judaic law. So it was a very interesting uh, situation that they were in. But Rasulullah interacted with this tribe and they were initially hostile to Islam. And the Prophet sent Ali ibn Abi Talib, his uh, cousin, to uh, basically besiege the tribe and to uh, subdue them. And the Rasulullah personally went and met with these people in the tribe. And of course, Ali ibn Hakim was one of the noblemen of this tribe. So the Rasul of course, his whole point is he wasn't a warmonger, he's not out there to, you know, control and to, um, you know, destroy. He was out there to spread his message of Tawheed, of La ilaha illallah. That was his whole purpose in life. So he wasn't there to, to uh, subjugate people. So he went to Hatim, he basically invited him to Islam. And Hatim al was his narrative that he was sitting there and he had a cross. He was wearing a cross around his chest. And he wasn't interested in Islam. He basically, you know, just politely declined. And the Rasul from his wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him, he looks at Hatim and says, Ya Hadi, ya Adi, sorry, not Hadim, Adi ibn Hadim. Hadim was his late father. He said, Ya Adi, la'allaka yamna'uka min al Islam. He said, Oh, Adi, perhaps the thing that is preventing you from Islam is that you see how poor the Muslims are. The Muslims at that time were not wealthy, right? This is a late Medani phase, and even then the Muslims are still scraping by. Aisha radiallahu anha narrated that a month or two months would go by and the, the, the fire would not be kindled in the Prophet's home. They had nothing to cook. The Muslims were very poor people. So you know, oh, Ali, perhaps the thing that's preventing you from Islam is the fact that the Muslims are poor. He said, Allah, he said, I swear by Allah, Yushik, he says, it's very close that so much money will come to the Muslims that it will flow, meaning the wealth will flow in the lands of Muslims. And he said, and perhaps it is what is preventing you from Islam is that you see, he said, you see that the Muslims are very few and their enemies are many. Right? So he's, he's, he's basically filling in the blanks for Adi and Hadi. He's saying, or maybe you think the Muslims are poor. One day the money and wealth will flow to the Muslims. Perhaps you see the Muslims are few and their enemies are many. He said, but I swear, very close, Yushik, and Yushik in Arabic means that we're just we're right at the precipice of this. It's, very, it's coming close. That a woman will walk from Qadisiyya to this sacred house, the Inaika, on her camel and she fears nothing but Allah. Qadisiyah is all the way in the Persian Empire. To walk from Qadisiyah to, to Mecca means you're probably crossing four different territories, different tribes, different civilizations. When he says that a woman will do this, that means what? It is safe. It is all under one dominion. He says, you think the Muslims are little now. Perhaps the time will come where everything from Mecca to Qadisiyah, from, from Mecca to Persia, is, is going to be under the Muslims. And he finally says, and perhaps what is preventing you from Islam is that you see that the kingdoms and the sultans, the leaders, are not with the Muslims. Meaning the people that have political power are not Muslims. And he said, Allah, I swear by Allah, that perhaps the White Palace, and this makes, always makes me laugh, because back then they had a White House. Nowadays the White House is in DC. Back then the White House was in Tesafon in Persia. It was literally a white palace, and they called it the White Palace. This is where the Persian Empire emperor sat, and his crown was so heavy that it had to be hung from the ceiling, otherwise it would have broken his neck. Like this was the seat of power, this was their White House. He said, perhaps the Muslims will be in the White House. I see the, the, the White Palace being in the hands of the Muslims. Now when I happened, when I even happened, saw the Rasul say this, and he, he was so, with such confidence, eventually he decided that he was going to accept this then. I want to pause here for a second. You know what's amazing about this, subhanAllah? Everything the Prophet said to Adi ibn Hatim, you could say it to a non Muslim today. Am I, am I wrong? You could go to a Muslim, and I've heard this many times. I've heard a, a non Muslim say this. I believe he was atheist, I can't recall. But he said, 
All I need to know about why Islam is a false religion is look at the Muslim countries. That's all I need. That's enough proof for me. Look at how backwards they are. Look at how poor they are. Look at how uh, underdeveloped, war-torn, right? And some people, it's a fit that it becomes a, a, a test for a, a non-Muslim when he says, like, wow, if this is what Islam is, I don't want anything to do with it. Look at the atheist countries. Number one in education, number one in scientific development, human development index through the roof. Look at the Christian nations, right? Somebody, uh, there was an interview on a European uh, channel and uh, the interview partner, she was from a right-wing political group in Europe, and she said, why is it that Islam is so great? Why are all the Muslims running away from Muslim countries to get to Christian countries? SubhanAllah. And this is what Adi ibn Hattim was feeling. The Rasul says, perhaps, he didn't say it, but the Rasul said, verbalized what his internal thoughts were. He said, perhaps you don't want to accept Islam because you see how little we are and how great our enemies are. Perhaps you see how poor we are. Perhaps you see that power and kingdom and, and dominion is not in the hands of the Muslims. And the Rasul is basically telling him, listen, we have a saying in Arabic, the land will have me and have. For things to stay the same is impossible. The same countries that were backwards 100 years ago are now Number one in human development, highest GDP. If you look at these countries 100, 200 years ago, London, right, the great city of London, only 150 years ago, the sewage was flowing in the streets. They called it the stink capital. They literally, till this day, you still have these uh, hollow pipes that are going up into the sky. Why? Because the sewage was so overflowing that the smell had to be dissipated up into the air so people could breathe. This is the great London we're talking about only 150 years ago. And the countries that today are war-torn and backwards and disease-ridden, right? Where would they be very soon? Allah well, we don't know. Again, we sometimes forget that the entire seerah of the Prophet, a.s. 23 years. I'm older than 23. Some of, most of us in this room are older than 23. That's less than half a lifetime. And he went from being persecuted and fearing for his life and fearing from assassination attempts to being the sole, undisputed leader of Shibu Jadir al -Hadi. In less than 23 years. So Hadi ibn Hatim, he was going through this test that, you know, how can this religion be true? Look how poor the Muslims are, look how poor they are. And the Muslim says, listen, this is a religion of Allah. Right now, things are difficult. Right now, things are may not seem very attractive in a dunyawi perspective. But you don't know what could happen. And I swear by Allah. And everything the Prophet said came true. Qadisiya is most well known, not as a place, but as what? The battle where the Muslims defeated the Persians. The battle of Qadisiya. And we know now that the entire area of the Persian Empire is now fully Muslim. It's like over 90-something percent, right? The areas of Afghanistan and Khorasan and Iran, these are, Iraq, these are all like predominantly high Muslim areas, right? And the Muslims, the wealth that came into the Muslim hands in the later part of the Rasul's life and at the end of the, the, the reign of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman is something that we can't even appreciate. These were people that were herding sheep one moment and now the, the gold and the silver that was coming is, is it's unbel it's unbelievable, it's unimaginable. So Hadi ibn Hatim becomes a Muslim. And the Rasul sees him one day he still has the cross on his chest. And the Rasul says, take this weapon off of you. With them, this idol. He calls the cross an idol, subhanAllah. Just so that if people are a little confused, right, about what this cross represents, the Rasul makes it very clear. This is a weapon. This is a form of idolatry. People sometimes get confused and they say, oh, you know, Christians and they're all going to Jannah because they believe in Isa. Let's be very careful what we're saying here, right? This, this symbol and what it represents is not Islam. These are not the believers of Isa. These are the people that have insulted Isa more than anyone else. And the Rasul said, and then he begins to recite from the Quran, from Surah Al-Baraq, right? And that's how the narration they call Surah Al-Baraq, which is uh, Surah Al-Tawbah. 
And he says, اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أرباب من دون الله. He starts reciting the Quran and he says, they, meaning the people of Allah, the Jews and the Christians, have taken their rabbis and their priests as gods other than Allah. When Adi ibn Hattim hears this, he's a new convert, he says, wait a minute, something's wrong here. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I was Christian just, you know, a few days ago. I never worshipped the priests. We didn't take our priests and the Jews don't take the rabbis. What, what are you saying? These are not gods. And the Rasulullah said, is it not that they used to make things halal and you would follow them? He said, Bala, yes. He says, and is it not that they would make things haram and you would follow them? He said, yes. And he said, and is it not that you would follow them in their maasiyah, in their sinning? And he said, yes. He says, that is the worship of them. And this teaches us another very, very important lesson. The Prophet ﷺ, he told a very scary hadith. He says, be careful with your good deeds, like you use your good deeds. There are fitan, there are trials that are going to come as black as a piece of the night. Like imagine you see the night sky and it's pitch black and you cut a piece of it, you won't be able to see from how dark it is. Then the, the, these tests and trials that will come are going to be as dark as night. You don't see rajul. A person will go to sleep, woke men, he goes to sleep as a believer and he wakes up as a kafir. And he wakes up as a as a kafir and he goes to sleep again as a woman. He sells his religion for a piece of this dunya. This teaches us a very valuable lesson again through Adi ibn Hatim. What it means to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have Muslims, again, very topical, very relevant. He prays, he wakes up for Fajr. But if media tells him something is wrong, he follows what the media says. If his politician or his political party says that this is okay, then he says it's okay. If the person he votes for says that this is wrong, he says, no, I agree, this is also wrong. A person who wakes up for Fajr, and he prays faith in the message, and then he'll say, I think hijab is morally wrong. I don't believe a woman should wear hijab. This is backwards. I don't believe Sharia Allah is, makes any sense. I think it's backwards. It worked back then, but it has no relevance today. Oh, things are different now. The modern world, you need riba banks, you need this, you need freedom of religion, right? And he says these things and he doesn't think about it. Because of what popular social media says and what politicians say and what liberalism says, he follows these things. He doesn't think about them. He thinks he's a believer. And also says these are tests. A person goes to sleep and he doesn't know that he has committed shit, he has committed kufr. When you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something haram and you disagree with it, you know what you're saying? You disagree with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that anything less than disbelief? When a person, whether he is a rabbi or a priest or an influencer or a social media guru or a politician or a president goes against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and you follow him, by the definition of the Prophet said, you have worshipped him. By the definition of the Prophet, he says, Adi ibn Hazm, we don't worship our priests. He says, but you follow them in everything they did. That is the worship of them. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ As Allah subhanahu wa says, whoever doesn't follow or doesn't uh, rule with what Allah subhanahu wa has revealed, then they are the disbelievers. Now some of you will say, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not the president of a country. You know, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not anything powerful. I'm just an everyday, you know, I'm just an everyday person. So this doesn't, this A doesn't apply to me. It does. Because you are in charge of your family. You may be in charge of your business. You may be in charge of your community. You may be in charge of something small in your eyes. But if you go against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed because your heart leans more to a celebrity or to a political movement, then this is a form, kufr duna kufr, as I believe it was uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, 
Yeah, it is with disbelief below disbelief. And this is something that we should all be very, very careful of. Oh, my God. 